Welcome to chapter 3. In this chapter, we'll cover assembly language, which is a vital link between the hardware and software. Uh, just to reiterate, uh, this is chapter 3 of the book Computer Organization and Architecture. And the slides are meant to be used along with the book. Otherwise, the learning will remain incomplete. So let's first discuss an overview of assembly language. Subsequently, we'll discuss the syntax of assembly language. We'll design a simple assembly language of our own called the simple risk assembly language along with uh, its instructions and the instruction set architecture. Subsequently, we'll move on to functions and stacks, an advanced concept in assembly language. And we'll discuss the encoding So let's first define what is an assembly language. So an assembly language is a low-level programming language. Uh, so we'll discuss what is high-level and what is low-level. So uh, a low-level programming language uses very, very simple statements, where typically one statement corresponds to a single machine instruction. So these languages are specific to the instruction set architecture. And so, for example, C or Java can be uh, can run on any kind of a processor. However, uh, an assembly language is specific to only a particular processor or a particular family of processors. For example, it is possible to run C. Uh, let's move to a different media. For example, it is possible to run a C program on both an Intel machine and an ARM machine. However, Intel has its separate assembly language syntax and ARM has its separate assembly language syntax. So, so we'll, we'll discuss what it is. So C is a high level language because the concepts are at a very, very high and abstract level. And also, if this is a C program, a single statement in the C program can actually be many machine instructions, not one, but actually multiple machine instructions, a sequence of zeros and ones, multiple instructions. Whereas, in an assembly language program, A single statement typically in a most often corresponds to a single machine instruction. So this is the vital uh, and the most important difference between a high level language and a low level language. So this C would be an example of a high level language and an assembly would be an example of a low level language. So, uh, so actually an assembly language is not a single language, it rather refers to a family of low-level programming languages where each instruction set architecture has its own assembly language. For example, an Intel machine uh, like the one that's running on the desktop right now has its own assembly language. You can call it Intel assembly. Similarly, an ARM machine, an ARM processor, which has a separate ISA, a separate instruction set architecture, has its own assembly language. Right? You can call it ARM assembly language. So maybe. So has its own separate ARM assembly language. So different processors, different family of processors have their own assembly languages. And each assembly statement corresponds to typically a single machine instruction. Uh, so we can think of, think of it as a language that is very, very close to the hardware. So a typical assembly statement has two parts. 
it has an instruction code which is which represents a basic machine instruction something like add or subtract or multiply and it has a list of operands let us now take a look at the popularity of the of assembly so i have a browser window open which shows the popularity of the most po common uh, programming languages as of july 2016 so the first three are usual suspects java c and c++ but let's scroll down to the 10th entry the 10th entry is actually assembly language again assembly language is not a single language it's a family of languages where each processor family has its own assembly language but we see that from july 2015 till july 2016 assembly languages together are the 10th most popular language among all programming languages so this means that it is a very very important language for students to learn and they should be familiar with at least one flavor of assembly languages such that they can uh, program hardware much better and also understand how compilers and assemblers really work so that's why it makes a case for at least learning these languages one reason for the popularity of assembly languages is that we have many small devices today uh, for example, there are small controllers uh, in um, almost everything that we use. So nowadays, there are smart lights that sense if a user is in the room, they turn the light on, otherwise they turn it off. So this is actually an advantage of uh, you know very small hardware. And these small pieces of hardware are not programmed using high-level languages. Rather, they are programmed using assembly languages for the reasons of efficiency. So let's in introduce a term now called assemblers. So assemblers are programs that convert assembly language programs written in low level languages to machine code, a sequence of zeros and ones, essentially convert an assembly language program to a binary. So examples of these would be uh, for x86, NASM, uh, TASM and MASM are three very popular assemblers for x86 ISAs. There are similar uh, popular assemblers for ARM as well. Uh, the readers are requested to take a look at the website of the book to uh, get an idea of assemblers for different assembly languages. So on a, list, on a Linux system, it is possible to generate an assembly file. It's very easy. So uh, we need to run this command gcc minus capital S and the name of the C file or the name of the C++ file. So uh, say the name of the C file is file name dot C. Uh, its assembly file name uh, will be file name dot S. That is its assembly representation. So what gcc minus S does is that it converts a C file. It compiles it to produce an assembly file. And once an assembly file is generated, uh, you can open it in a text editor and see uh, the details of the assembly code that has been generated. Then to generate a binary, we can run the same GCC command once again and run it uh, and run the command GCC file name dot S, uh, which will generate a binary called A dot out. And then running the binary is very, very easy. Uh, what we need to do Uh, is that so running the binary is very easy uh, so in Linux it is just as simple as dot slash a dot out so in this case what we see is that if we have a C program with the name file name dot C a compiler converts it uh, to uh, so the uh, compiler command is gcc minus capital S that converts the C file into an assembly file uh, that's file name dot S and the file name dot S can be further converted to a binary which the processor can understand the sequence of zeros and ones via using the command gcc so this holds in a Linux system it will also hold on a system with Mac OS X uh, with code blocks installed 
On Windows, there are different commands, so I'll not get into that. So let's now take a look at the importance of assembly language from a hardware designer's perspective. So learning the assembly language is the same as learning the intricacies of the instruction set because every assembly language statement corresponds to a single instruction. So once a hardware designer knows the format of assembly language, he pretty much knows what is to be built. Uh, so, so what is the interface between software and hardware, which makes it easy to design hardware as well. So now let's start with the nitty gritties of assembly language, but let's go back to chapter one, where we had discussed the structure of a von Neumann machine. So von Neumann machine had the CPU at the center. So the CPU was at the center. Uh, it was connected to memory. The memory contains data as well as data as well as instructions. And it, the CPU is also connected to IO devices. Inside the CPU, we have a control unit, an arithmetic logic unit, and a set of registers. So the registers are named storage locations. In ARM assembly, they are called R0, R1, till R15. In x86 assembly, where uh, the Intel family, Intel and AMD family of processors use x86 assembly, the registers are typically referred to as EAX, EBX, ECX, EDX, ESI, and EDI. So these are general purpose registers. Additionally, there are machine specific registers which allow you very fine grained and you know, internal access to changing things such as the speed of fans, the power, temperature controls, settings. So these are called machine specific registers, which are you know, specific to the processor, not necessarily specific to the processor family. Then there are registers with some special functions. So one of them is the stack pointer that we shall discuss later. Then we have the program counter. We all know what the program counter stands for, uh, chapter one. It essentially points to the address of the currently executing instruction. Then there is also a return address register that we'll come to later. So now let's take a look at memory. So memory, all assembly language programs, or all programs for that matter, look at memory as one large array of bytes, one huge, huge, very large array of bytes. Each byte or each location has an address. So the address of the first memory location, the first byte, so we start counting from zero in computer science. So the address of the first byte is zero. The address of the second byte is one. Similarly, the address of the nth byte is n minus one. So the program is stored in a certain part of memory. So we can assume that the program is stored over here and the data is stored in some other part of memory. So we can assume that it's stored somewhere over here. So every binary assumes that the entire memory belongs to itself. And so we are up till now not discussing what happens if you're running multiple programs at the same time. We will come to that slightly later. At the moment, we are only talking about how an assembly program or a binary program would actually view memory. And the program counter contains the address which is essentially uh, you know, the address of the location of the current instruction. So the current instruction starts from here. So this address is contained inside the program counter. So now let's take a look at how data is stored in memory before we actually discuss more about assembly languages. So there are four uh, mainly you know, different kind of data. But the typical data types that we use in C are of this type. We have a char or a character, which is one byte. Uh, we have a short integer, which is two bytes. A regular integer, which is typically four bytes. And a long integer, typically eight bytes. So mo both C as well as Java follow this con convention. So the question that we need to answer is that in memory, how exactly is data stored? So how is the four byte integer stored? So what we do is that we save the four bytes in consecutive locations in memory, starting, so let's say first location is i, and the last location is i plus three. 
So there are two ways in which we can store data. Uh, so one is called a little endian representation. This is used in the ARM and x86 family of processors. Here the least significant byte is stored in the lowest location. So we shall uh, you know, see a visual depiction of this on the next slide. Then we have the big endian representation used by SunSpark and IBM Power PC. Here the most significant byte is stored in the lowest location. So let's take a look at examples of this. So let's consider an integer of this form that actually contains four bytes. It's in a hex notation. So one digit is four bits. So as a result, two digits is one byte. So this is the first byte, second byte, third and fourth. So in the big Indian notation, the way that we actually store it is that the most significant byte, the MSP, is actually stored in the lowest or the smallest memory location. So first we store 887, eight then we store 65, then 43 and then 21. In the little endian location, we store the least significant byte first. So we store 21 over here, then 43, then 65 and then 87. So what is different is the order of the storage of bytes and so this is a matter of convention. One you know, we can't argue that little endian is better than big endian or vice versa. It's just a matter of convention of how data is stored. So ARM and x86 designers have gone for little endian. Whereas uh, IBM and uh, Sun designers have gone for the big endian scheme. So different conventions are there and the hardware as well as the assembly language writer, the assembler and compiler writers need to be aware of the particular uh, mechanism or scheme that's being used. So now that we know of how uh, individual integers are stored, we should also take a look at how arrays are stored. So an array of integers is basically a set of n integers. So let us consider an array of integers a hundred. So the way it is stored is actually very simple. We store the first, uh, we store the first element of the array a0. Then in a consecutive location, we store a1 and a2 and a3 and so on. Say so one integer is four bytes, the entire array would take 400 bytes, and we save the integers in consecutive memory locations, right? And each integer is stored in either a little endian or a big endian format, depending upon the convention followed by the processor. Now there are an interesting question arises that how do we store a two dimensional array? You know, an array that has an array that has both rows and columns, how do we store it? So there are two methods, row major and column major. So row major scheme is used in high level languages such as C and Python. So here what we do is that we store the first row as an 1D array, then we store the second row and so on. So let me just uh, show you with an example. So let's assume that this is a 2D array with rows and columns. So a 2D array is a matrix. So what we do in a row major scheme is that we first store the first row. Then we store the integers belonging to the second row. Then we store the data belonging to the third row. The other scheme called column major, which is followed by programming languages such as Fortran and MATLAB, they actually store the first column, then the second column and so on. So there are trade-offs between row major and column major, but we are not in a position to appreciate this right now. We'll discuss more of it in chapter 10. So what exactly is column major? So in column major, the first column is stored. Then the second column is stored. And then the third column is stored. Right? In, uh, in memory. So both of these approaches are uh, sort of opposites of each other. In one case, we traverse the array row-wise. In other case, we traverse the array column-wise. 
So there are trade-offs in this. Uh, so it depends upon the way that we write programs. So we'll discuss more about this in chapter 10. But what is important to know, so the main take home point here is that all programs, including assembly languages uh, and processors, fundamentally assume that the memory is one large array of bytes. To save an integer, we, uh, which is a four byte integer, we take four consecutive locations in memory and save the integer in either a big endian or a little endian format. To save an array of integers, we can save it in any form that we want, row major or column major. So let's assume we want to save the array A100. If one integer is four bytes, we need to take up a space in memory, which is 400 bytes, and save the 100 integers. And each integer can be saved in either the big endian or the little endian format. Now let us take a look at the syntax of assembly language. Uh, so syntax basically refers to the way that assembly language is written. So a typical assembly file uh, looks as shown over here. So there are many kinds of assembly languages for many kinds of architectures, many kinds of ISAs. So clearly all of them have different formats, sometimes very different formats. Uh, we will discuss the assembly structure of the GNU assembler, uh, which is uh, very common in Linux and Mac OS. Even other assembly files in uh, diverse operating systems such as Windows have a roughly similar structure, even though there are differences. But we only want to discuss the generic parts in this lecture. So if I consider a certain assembly file, uh, the first part of the assembly file contains some meta information, like the name of the uh, original program that, uh, you know, that this assembly file corresponds to. The dot text section corresponds to all the instructions. And the dot data section corresponds to all the data that is accessed by the program, all the constants, particularly that are accessed by the program. So the important point to note over here is that an assembly file is divided into different sections. And each such section uh, is demarcated with identifiers. In the GNU assembly case, these identifiers are dot .file, dot .text, and dot .data. So as mentioned in the previous slide, uh, previous slide dot file refers to the name of the source file dot text section the text section contains a list of instructions and the data section contains uh, the values of read only variables and constants so the structure of an assembly statement is typically like this that we have an instruction and then we have a list of operands which are the arguments of the instruction each instruction, as described before, corresponds to typically one machine instruction. And the operands can be of different types. For example, they can be a constant. So a constant is also known as an immediate. A constant, examples of a constant are 3, 4, 5, you know, numeric constants, character constants, string constants. So in assembly language parlance, they are typically referred to as immediates. The operands can also be registers. And the operands can also be memory locations. So we'll look at more of how to specify our different kinds of operands. So let's take a look at examples of instructions. So the first one is a sub instruction, a subtract instruction. Uh, what this achieves is that uh, it subtracts the contents of R2 from R1 and saves the result uh, in R3. So if we want to write, we can write this in this form. So this is similar to Similarly, the next assembly instruction, 
is similar to R3 is equal to R1 multiplied by R2. So in this sense, this is like a high-level programming language, albeit the syntax is slightly different. So the destination always comes first. So the first operand is typically the destination. And the next two operands are the source operands. Uh, so the source operands in this case are specified using registers. But that need not be the case. So we'll take a look at that uh, in the next few slides. So the generic, but this is one kind of the previous, uh, these two assembly statements are only one kind of assembly statements. There can be many other kinds as well. Uh, let's take a look at some. So we can have a generic assembly instruction uh, followed by a comment. So there are two ways of commenting that we will look at uh, uh, in this chapter. Uh, the first comment starts with an at, say anything after an at is a comment. Or we can have generic C style comments with a slash star and then a trailing star slash. So the comments can always come at the end of a statement or you can have an entire line with the comment. The assembly statement itself can be an assembly instruction or we can define a constant or we can have an assembly directive which is essentially an instruction to the assembler to do something special. So we'll discuss that later. And the entire assembly statement inclusive of the comment can be preceded by a label. So label can be thought of as, so it's similar to a label that is used in a go-to statement in C. It uniquely uh, points to the assembly statement that is after it. So we can have a label and then a colon and then specify the assembly instruction. Later on, if you want to come back to this label, we just need to have something to the effect, go to label, and the control will jump back to this particular label. So label is an optional argument. It's not required all the time. But whenever we want to jump to this particular statement from anywhere else in the program, we can use the label to indicate uh, this particular line. So a label is essentially the identifier of a statement. And as uh, I told you before, a directive tells the assembler to do something. You know, maybe let's say declare a function or declare the fact that a new section is starting in the file. So there are many kinds of directives. We'll discuss that gradually. So in the generic statement structure, uh, we have already looked at the assembly instruction part and the comment part. So we can have many kinds of instructions. So primarily four kinds. So we can have data processing instructions. So these instructions are typically arithmetic and logical uh, instructions. Uh, they can be used to add, subtract, multiply, divide numbers, perform arithmetic operations on them. Also, they can be used to compare two numbers and store the result somewhere else. We'll, we'll discuss where that somewhere else is. Uh, also, uh, do Boolean operations between the values stored in registers, uh, namely a logical or, a logical and, or a logical not. So these are all Boolean operations that can be done uh, by this family of instructions called data processing instructions. Similarly, we can have data transfer instructions. These instructions transfer values between registers and memory locations. So these are also very useful to bring in data from memory to registers and also to move data between registers as well as move data from registers to memory locations back. Then we, of course, need branch instructions to implement for loops, while loops, if statements. So branch instruction is typically like this, that we branch to a given label, where the label is what we looked at in the previous slide. It uniquely identifies an instruction, an assembly statement. Along with data processing, data transfer, and branch instructions, we can have special instructions to interact with peripheral devices and uh, 
other programs or set machine specific parameters or essentially access uh, special parts of the computer system that are otherwise not accessible to high level programs. So these are special instructions. Let us now discuss the nature of operands. So let's begin by classifying instructions and defining some basic terms. So if an instruction takes n operands as input, then uh, we say that it's in the n address format. For example, this instruction over here, the add instruction, takes three operands as input. So we say that it's in the three address format. So similarly, we can have instructions in the one address, two address, and we can even have four address format instructions. So an address format basically refers to the number of operands that an instruction takes. Let's then look at the addressing mode. So the method of specifying and accessing an operand in an assembly statement is known as the addressing mode. So we'll see there are many kinds of addressing modes. For example, in this assembly statement over here, each operand is a register uh, based operand. So the addressing mode is a register based addressing mode. So le now let's introduce the register transfer notation. We'll actually require it uh, to uh, specify the semantics, the way that uh, our assembly instructions work. So the, in the register transfer notation, let's take a look at the most basic uh, notation over here, R1, the contents of R2 being assigned to R1. So this basically, so this arrow indicates that the direction of data transfer is from R2 to R1. So this says that transfer the contents of register R2 to register R1. So we can have a slightly more complicated representation as well. So this uh, representation says that add four to the contents of register R2, essentially add an immediate to the contents of register R2 and then transfer the contents to register R1. The last uh, expression is slightly different. So what this says is that we first access the contents of register R2 and then so assume that uh, the contents of register R2 are let's say 8. We access the integer, the 4 byte integer whose starting address is 8 and then we subsequently read subsequently we read 4 bytes starting at location 8 so essentially we read the bytes at location 8, 9, 10 and 11 so these 4 bytes uh, make one integer this integer is transferred to register R1 so in this case, we are actually accessing a location in memory. The address of the location is specified in register R2. So if we read the definition uh, that's mentioned over here, it says we access the memory location that matches the contents of R2. So in this case, in the example, the contents of R2 are 8. So we start from memory location 8 and read 4 bytes starting at 8, 9, 10 and 11. So four bytes make one integer and then the integer is stored. So in this case, the integer is the data that is coming from memory. This is stored in register R1. So this is a memory load operation. So this is this operation is called a memory load because we are loading data from memory. So let's take a look at some of the very basic addressing modes. So uh, let uh, V be the value of an operand and let R1 and R2 specify registers. So the convention is always that R1, you know, any variable starting with R always specifies a register. So let's take a look at the immediate addressing mode. In the immediate addressing mode, the constant itself is the value. For example, uh, 4, 8 or a hexadecimal constant over here. Uh, which is 0x13 
it's 19 in decimal or even a negative number can be anything can be any kind of a constant uh, this uh, so when a constant is directly used as is for example if I have an instruction of this form add r1 r2 and 4 this particular operand is using the immediate addressing mode because the constant is specified as is similarly we can use the register direct addressing mode where the value of stored in the register is what is being used so in this case r1 is using the register direct addressing mode similarly we can use the register indirect addressing mode something that we had seen in the previous slide uh, in this particular point for example uh, we can in some variants in some assembly languages we can write a function of this type add r2 r2 r3 and r1 so in this case r1 actually contains a memory address this will be used to access memory we will read four bytes from there the size of an integer and this will be added to the contents of r3 and finally we saved in r2 so this is called the register indirect addressing mode because what the register contains is actually a memory address the address is sent to the memory we get contents from the memory and then use it in an instruction similarly we can use we can slightly extend this to create the base offset addressing mode so in this case uh, the actual value that is uh, being uh, used by the program is actually r1 so so in this case let's consider an example and then explain the theory part of it so let's co uh, consider this operand over here which is using the base offset addressing mode so what this basically says is that we take the contents of r1 so let's let this be the contents of r1 and then we add it with the constant here 20 so assume that the contents of r1 were 8 so we add 8 and 20 and we get 28 we use 28 to access the 28th location of memory and then we read 4 bytes from the 28 to the 31st location and these 4 bytes are then used by the program so this is a base offset addressing mode because in this case r1 contains the base address and the offset is 20 so we add both of them we get a final address that's called the effective address which is used to access memory and then we get the contents of an integer from memory we, we read an integer from memory and this is used by the program so the same thing is shown over here that we take the value of r1 we add it to the offset the square brackets in indicate that the address is sent to memory and we read the contents from memory and this is the final value that we use so let's show the register indirect mode once again using a set of better pictures so as uh, mentioned over here we take the value of r1 and whatever is the value of r1 we use it uh, we first read it from the register file and then we use the value to access memory so let's assume that for example r1 contained 32 so we access the 32nd location in memory and read four bytes so for simplicity we have not shown four entries and we finally read the value out now let's discuss the base offset addressing mode so this mode will be very useful for implementing arrays so the main idea over here is to actually use a register called the base register in this case in this example it is r1 so r1 is used to access the register file from the register file we read the contents of r1 and we add it to the offset so we get an address as the output and this is called the effective address but let me just call it 
as the address for the time being. The address is used to access memory and finally we read uh, four bytes from the memory. So the four bytes are part of the single cell. Uh, this is drawn to enhance readability. So the four bytes are the value of this particular operand. So what exactly is the base offset addressing mode again? We have a register and an offset. We read the contents of the register, add it to the offset. This gives us an address. We use this address to access memory. So for example, let's say the address is 28. So we access the 28 location in memory and read four bytes. And these four bytes are the final value of the instruction. So let's discuss some more addressing modes which are not very frequently used. But nevertheless, they are common enough that we should you know, discuss them. And especially when we take a look at the x86 instruction set, we would find these addressing modes to be extremely useful. So one of them is the base index offset addressing mode. So in this case, we instead of one register, we have two registers. So we have a base register, which in this case is R1. We have an index register, which is R2 in this example. And we have an offset, which is an immediate. So we add the contents of the two registers and the offset. We get an address. This address is used to access memory. And we read the value out. So this is the value of the operand. So one example would be 100 R1 R2. Here R1 is the base register, R2 is the index, and 100 is the offset. So note that this sign of braces, the square braces, are used to indicate that the contents within the braces refer to an address. And once we add the braces, we are supposed to access memory with the address and treat the locations in memory as containing a value as containing the value of the operand. So we can again have a memory direct addressing mode, which is not there in most ISAs, but it's there in x86. In this case, if we know the address of the memory location, we can directly specify it. We don't need to add it in a register. Instead, we can directly specify it. So in this case, if this is the address of the memory, we directly specify it and enclose it in curly, I'm sorry, in square brackets or in braces. And this indicates that we access memory with this address and the subsequent four bytes contain the data of the operand. Lastly, let's take a look at a certain variant of a register indirect addressing mode, which is actually very useful. It's called the PC relative addressing mode, where instead of using a general purpose data register, we use the program counter. We treat the program counter as a register. So in this case, we take the contents of the program counter, add an offset to it to get an address, and we use the sum of both to actually access instruction memory. So let this be the memory in specific, the instruction memory. So then the next four bytes uh, are actually the contents of the operand. So the next four bytes are typically an instruction in a 32 bit system. Uh, which we assume to be the default in at least in this book. Uh, this is uh, so these four bytes from the PC will typically point to an instruction. So we will find this addressing mode very, very useful. This addressing mode will be found to be useful, especially while implementing the concept of if statements for loops and while loops in assembly that we'll be able to change the PC, the program counter to uh, essentially we'll be able to change its value and jump to different points within the program, which is exactly what an if statement or a for loop or a while loop do. 
so so let's keep it let's keep this discussion at this point and when we discuss when we go into the nitty gritties of assembly language we'll come back and revisit this point so let's take a look at the base index offset addressing mode once again with a better diagram in this case we have two registers we have r1 and we have r2 so both the registers are used to access the register file we add their contents plus the offset then we access memory and we use the value 